But uh, I'm really I'm out here tonight to talk about Bill Whitliff. Bill is on the board of the Austin Film Festival, and that's how we've gotten to know each other. And looking around at the flourishing Austin movie scene today, it's easy for, to forget that there was a time when the movie industry here existed to a large extent inside the very imaginative head of the man that's my great pleasure to be introducing, Bill Whitliff. As a writer is the genesis of a film, it's fitting that a writer helps start the film industry in Austin, and that that writer would be one of the first honorees of the Texas Film Hall of Fame. Obviously, certain things come to mind regarding Bill, particularly his credits. He's known for bringing us the classic miniseries, Lonesome Dove, and for such blockbusters as Legends of the Fall and This Summer's Perfect Storm. But to me, what comes to mind about Bill are his are words, and perhaps the strongest of those words is, is Maverick. Not in the James Garner way, but Sam Maverick. Sam was another product of the, of the Texas Hill Country, and Sam won a load of cattle in a poker game. Being a nonconformist, he never bothered to brand them. Bill, also an expert poker player, attracted a lot of attention from Hollywood after the Black Stallion. And they courted him to load up his truck and move out to the Beverly Hill country so they could put their Hollywood brand on him. But Bill said no thanks. Bill's home was Austin and always the maverick. He decided he could write scripts a lot easier from home. Next up for Bill was Raggedy Man, starring Sissy Spacek, who's also here this evening. On this one, Bill, the writer, actually demanded to co-produce the movie and then that it be shot here in Texas. No writer in Texas at that time had ever talked a major studio into such an arrangement before. Needless to say, people started to notice Bill was a trailblazer. If he could live here and make movies, maybe they could too. All the while, Bill followed his passions. He's been steadily busy writing and producing. He's become a noted photographer, book designer, publisher, and collector. He and his wife, Sally, are the co-founders of the Southwest Writers Collection and Whitliff Gallery of Southwestern and Mexican Photography at Southwest Texas State University. <laughs> Ultimately, what Bill is, though, is a storyteller. Bill once told me that writers write, and then they write, and then they rewrite, and then they rewrite. You just stay at it. In the eight years that I've known Bill, that's what I've seen him do. Faithfully going into that big old house he shares with O. Henry's ghost, or so he says, and doggedly writing in longhand so he wouldn't become a slave to the computer, and at the same time amassing a great body of work. And yet he's also managed to be an inspiration to young writers and young filmmakers, not just through his commitment and tenacity, but by actually taking the time to return their phone calls answer their questions, and inspire and encourage them to keep writing. Never one to rest on his laurels, though, Bill has moved on from the greatest storm in recorded history to tackling the Transcontinental Railroad with Martin Scorsese and DreamWorks and the conquest of Mexico with APG. Through the Austin Film Festival, I've met many tremendously talented and acclaimed writers, but I can't think of one who's more apt to make these projects happen and give us a great movie-going experience at the same time. It's my honor to induct Bill Whitliff as a first screenwriter in the Texas Film Hall of Fame. Before Bill comes up, I think we're gonna see a clip. Well, you're just a damn barn boy. Yes, sir. No! Your hellish ways are interrupting our service. Lord, <laughs> well, the devil's own disciples have gathered at our door today. Well, here we are, my God, preacher. <laughs> I'm trying, Lord, but I'm finding it difficult to concentrate on my text. Here's what I'm asking you to do. Send down a curse on these heathens. Send a visage as black as night to pluck out their eyes so they can't seem to find this place ever again. Preacher, you just wait just a minute. And send out a plague 
that will turn their lips and tongues to a festering rot. And if they still persist in their evil mockings, send a horrible and eternal death to each man here and to the seeds of his loins in the form of a thousand crooked vipers, each viper with a thousand heads and each head with a thousand fangs, each... Ladies and gentlemen, go with us. see a damn thing from up here. <laughs> well, listen, I'm a, I'm a lucky boy, and I'm much blessed. And I'm, I'm hugely grateful to be in the company of Sissy and Liz and Mike and, and Bob. Um, nobody does this stuff by themselves. God knows I never did. For me, in the beginning, was my wife, Sally. Sally was my... <laughs> me too. Sally was my, my first reader. Sally was my first honest critic. Sally is the one who, who made me believe maybe I could do this stuff and, and gave me confidence to try it. And then came our children, Allison and Reed. And they used to sit in the middle of the floor and I'd read scripts to them and I'd try story ideas on them. Um, sometimes they'd smile and nod, sometimes they'd give me the raspberry. Sometimes they'd squeeze their hands in their armpits and make rude noises. Uh, it was a very humbling experience, I can tell you. And all along, I've had enormously good and bright help in my office. Um, for 15 years, it was the irrepressible Connie Todd. More recently, more recently, it's been an quote in Texas Monthly now, the delightfully irreverent Mary, Mary Levy, who I hope will be there for a long, long time. For a quarter of a century and more, my friend and agent Jim Wyatt has warred for me, stood for me, occasionally cried for me, and that's true also my lawyer, Bob Wallerston. And two, there's my eternal amigo, Bud Schreit. Bud popped into my office the, the day I finished my first script. And um, that night he took it home to read. Next morning he called me and said, this damn thing will sell. And he straight away sent it to his agent in New York. As it turned out, she absolutely hated it and said so in a three-page letter. But Bud turned out to be the better prophet, and it was Barbarossa. And uh, finally it did move, and finally it did get made. Um, Bud still reads my stuff. I still treasure his responses. I still treasure his, his friendship. Incidentally, um, Bud called me today and suggested an opening line for my, my acceptance response. He said, I ought to say, well, I just flew in from L.A., and boy, are my arms tired. But I thought I'd heard that before, so I didn't use it. As I said, I'm, I'm a lucky man and, and much, much blessed. I feel particularly blessed that my bent has been toward trying to tell stories. I believe with all my heart that storytelling is a high calling. Indeed, I believe it is a sacred calling. Since time immemorial, it has been the storytellers who have tried to point the way for the rest of us. By example of our stories and the trials and tribulations of the characters create, we boldly project our imaginations out in the world. Not so much to escape reality, I think, but rather to create new realities, new worlds, better ways to conduct lives. We're the ones who dare say, this is the way to live, this is the way to go. Possibly fulfillment lies this way. We're also the ones who try to warn against other paths. Don't go this way. This way lies doom and damnation. We are, of course, playing God. And to do that, 
and to ask for an hour and a half of somebody else's life in a darkened room full of flickering lights. It takes just one goddamn big whopping bunch of arrogance. We've all got it to one degree or another. The trick is to earn that arrogance. I have my doubts, but I'm ever grateful that somebody in this deal thinks that maybe once or twice I may have earned mine. Thank you.